Hey everybody, it's Brandon Altman from here at Pittsburgh, Branch 860. Today I wanted to go over a survey on one of our own machines. I'm here at Los Mayos in Zelianopol and they let us use their kitchen for a little bit. Uh, they just recently started leasing this A4 off of us uh, to start their new business with and they've been loving it. And they have a big kitchen so we thought this would be a great place. Uh, the first thing we want to do uh, with any survey and anything we do in any kitchen is to have our safety equipment on. Uh, PPE, we want to have our glasses on for sure, and I always wear nitrile gloves when I'm messing with really hot water or any chemicals. Um, so this machine, what we're going to do today is we're going to figure out how much water that our machines use on a regular basis, and we're going to measure wash pressure, and we're going to go over how to catch chemical, measure the water, and measure the wash pressure. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by making sure that the machines run one or two cycles. What this will do is it'll always put the water level where we have it set at. Uh, there's a way to adjust them. If you want to sign down here real quick for the newbies, down in this control cabinet is the place to adjust all of the chemical and uh, water drain settings with our timer. So each of these cams in here, I'll show you in a second. So in here, this is the timer. The timer spins and operates on a 90 second cycle which allows each of the functions of the drain, the detergent, sanitizer, rinse, fill to operate uh, at a time that we set it for. By opening and closing them, we can change how long each of the functions operates for to shorten fill time or lengthen the drain, put more or less chemical in. So what we do when we adjust those things is we're able to titrate the amount of detergent that goes in that tells us the concentration of the alkalinity of the water and we can set the sanitizer level per the health department's request at 50 parts per million minimum. Uh, typically you don't want to go over 100 or they'll red flag that being as a too high of a setting. So today we're just going to go over some of those things. So when we first started we mentioned about running the machine a cycle or two to get the water level to where it would typically rest at. So the first thing I like to do is check the water level. I do the same thing on a competitor's machine as I'm going to do for ours. So after the machine has sat and rested, the water level is just mellow. I take something like a screwdriver or a butter knife or something and I go in the machine and I mark the water level where it is inside the pan. So the water level in this machine is right there. We're going to mark it with a screwdriver. Now what we're going to do is we're going to drain the machine out and get all of the water out of the machine. After the water's left, we replace this plunger. So to start my test, after I mark the water level with a screwdriver, butter knife, something along those lines, I release the water from the pan by pulling the plunger, let all the water exit the machine, and then I replace the plunger. I've already got ready a bucket that has increments on it up to a gallon. So there's a gallon of water in this bucket. I'm going to add this gallon of water to the machine slowly as not to move my indicator by the water thrashing around. And we let that water rest for a second and see where it comes to. Now these machines run right around one gallon, just over a gallon. Um, that water is right at my screwdriver. Water in and, it, and you can see where the water level is to my indicator. Um, our machine shows on the uh, spec sheet that it uses 1.09 gallons and I'm pretty sure that 0 0.09 is in the transfer tube between the sump and the pump because that one gallon of water brought my pan right back to where it was. So I suspect this machine will run efficiently with that one gallon refill. Our machines fill through the pump which allows us to push all of the soil water out of the impeller down the drain. We're also flushing the arms uh, and we're pushing all that dirty water out as opposed to just filling through the top of the machine. Uh, what that does is it really reduces how much carryover and residual goes into the rinse cycle. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to discuss some of the things that operate the machine to give us the wash efficiency that we're looking for. Inside we have these beautifully designed wash arms that are unlike any I've ever seen in 20 years. I'm going to take one out and show you guys real quick. So a standard dish machine, like our competitors use, have a flat surface here at the wash arm hub. 
Uh, what I've learned since Autoclor is that this machine design with this arm allows the water to come up and race towards the end of the arm and come out of the jets. And it changes the velocity, quite frankly. If this water had to come up and smack against a flat surface, it slows it down before it can go over. That's what gives us the wash pressure and uh, reducing the water volume by constantly keeping that water moving. The wash jets that our machines use are unique in that if you look at a competitor's wash jet nozzles, the hole in them is more of a circle. It's not quite as refined of an oval as ours are. What that is, is it's like the theory of putting your thumb over the end of your garden hose. Without your thumb, you might be able to turn your hose on and water a plant. But as soon as you put your thumb over the end of that and start pinching off that hole, you're now able to hit the neighbor's house, which is reducing the water volume, but increasing the pressure, which is what these things do. That's what sets us apart. Another thing that I wanted to bring up is the difference of our sump screen. Uh, in 20 years, I never picked up a sump screen that, that weighed this much. This thing is solid brass and chrome plated brass. Typically machines come with a plastic sump screen. It's real lightweight. Uh, they break, first of all, let's be honest. But another thing that's completely different is when that water's swirling and all that motion's going on, that sump screen that's lightweight is actually flopping around in there. And that flopping allows lemon seeds, sweet and low wrappers, popcorn kernels, all that stuff to sneak past here, which goes through our pump, through the impeller, could be clogging that stuff up. It's definitely clogging up the wash jets. The difference is, is this thing weighs so much that it never moves. Once this thing is set into place, it has almost a positive metal on metal contact seal down there. And the weight of that does not allow anything to sneak under it. It's also a very nice tight seal around the top, which keeps everything from getting through there. Um, I, I, as long as I've been doing this, I rarely see clogged wash jets as much as I used to, thanks to this sump screen. So what we're gonna do now, is we're gonna fill the machine back up. We have a clean sump screen. We have clear wash jets. Those are two of the most important things to getting great results. If the sump screen's clogged, it's not pulling all that water through. If the wash jets are clogged, it's not pushing all that water out. Those are two visible things that we can look at and we can teach our customers, clients, prospects, employees to keep a really close eye on. Uh, when those two things are clean, it's in our favor. Okay, so with that one gallon of water that we replaced in the sump after we drained the water out, we're gonna test and see if that one gallon of water is enough for our machine to operate off of. This is gonna be operations we listen to. We're gonna to listen to see if the machine is what's called starving for water or it's sucking air. Uh, it's gonna sound inconsistent. We want it to sound like a freight train. So we're gonna hit the start button, see what we come up with. If you could see inside this machine right now, we actually have best case scenario. The water is swirling uh, in a counterclockwise motion like it would always do and you can just see the scrap uh, sump screen in there, uh, meaning that there's not an abundance of water in there that's not being utilized, and we aren't starving for any water. So this machine refills with one gallon of water to operate. That does not include the amount of flush that goes on. Uh, the longer you have the flush, which we're gonna investigate here in a second, uh, is also using water. All right, so we're gonna be listening to the drain time how long the drain's open, when the fill kicks on, to flush the pan, drain's open, water's out, fill kicked on, flushing the pan, flushing the pump, drain should drop about now, that's perfect. We wanna make sure that we get all the food residue and oils down the drain before we start to refill for the, for the rinse cycle. Um, by doing so, we're making sure that we're not having any residual or carry over soils into the rinse cycle. The machine fills up the way it's supposed to with the gallon of water, and we're in a good rinse. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the wash pressure that our machine produces. All those things I was showing you with the wash jets, how they have the tapered hole, uh, the tapered hole resembling the garden hose and your thumb. That's what produces what's actually blasting the food off of the plates. So I have a pressure gauge I'm gonna show you. I made this thing. I thought it was pretty helpful to show prospects the difference between the run-of-the-mill machine that they can get off the internet 
by themselves that they're paying a buku bucks through their vendor to get, or the machine that we manufacture that we make certain that we are putting the best product out there to give our customers the results they're looking for. Uh, we're not here to sell them chemicals, we're here to give them results and service. Uh, our machine produces more wash pressure than any machine that I've come across, uh, and we're gonna show you how to test that. The average machines that I've looked at through our competition are honestly as bad as five pounds of wash pressure, all the way up to 13 to 15, depending, because it kind of sloshes. It's not as consistent as we're looking for. So all this is is a piece of discharge hose, a hose clamp, and a pressure gauge from the local hardware store with a couple fittings. This is zero to 30, which is all the range we're gonna need. Uh, and we're gonna hook this up real quick. I got the hose soft by sticking it in the water. I'm gonna feed it down through the pan and bring it up over here. So now it's inside the dishwasher. So we're just hose clamping this discharge hose on the end of our wash arm. All right, so what we're doing now is we're reconnecting the wash arm to the hub with our hub nut. Make sure it's, it's finger tight and then some. And now what we're gonna do is look at this gauge as we shut the water. Gotta be careful we don't let a bunch of water out by bumping this, but now when we hit this start button, we're gonna watch the wash pressure jump from zero to where our machine typically runs at. I haven't found an auto chlor machine that runs less than 20 pounds, so we're gonna see where this goes. We're running right around 21 and a half, 21 PSI. All right, seeing that pressure, is what cleans the dishes. The chemical, the hot water, and that pressure is what removes the food soils. So having 21 pounds of pressure compared to the five through 13, uh, it's drastic. We wanna make sure that we understand the wash pressure system, why the water sprays as hard as it does. Does it make a difference between this machine and that machine? Absolutely. Uh, it's like the difference between trying to clean your sidewalk with a garden hose or trying to clean your sidewalk with a pressure washer. Uh, the pressure washer is the way to go. So this machine has the highest rating of pressure I've seen in 20 years. Over 20 PSI on every machine I've surveyed, which is pretty much every one we put out in the field. After we install them, I go check, make sure the chemical levels are good, uh, the water setting, the pressure's working well, everything's wiped off nice and shiny. Uh, so when I do that, it's impressive to see that all the machines are consistently throwing out that kind of wash pressure. So enough about that. We're gonna disconnect that pressure gauge from the wash arm and uh, move on to chemical dosages. I'm sure you guys have already gone through an explanation or understanding of alkalinity and things like that and how rinse additive makes things, makes the wet wetter, which is what gives us the spot free rinse and stuff. But I wanted to explain how we achieve that so we wanna make sure that we have the alkalinity where it needs to be with our gallon of water to, to make sure that we're giving our customers you know, clean results, fingerprints and stuff like that uh, come off with alkalinity. So we wanna make sure that the alkalinity is right. In all restaurants, there's things like alkalinities and acids and they are opposites of each other. So whenever you have tomato sauces that are being uh, introduced to the water, if you don't have a high enough pH level or enough alkalinity, the balance of the acid in there can actually neutralize the chemicals and make it, it it's not even doing anything, it's just slopping water around in there. Uh, the higher our titration level is, uh, certain places that we deal with, like Pizza Huts, they deal with a lot of oils and starches and fats. So we wanna make sure that that alkalinity is at the peak where we can have it to where it drains and flushes the pan to where we have none in the rinse but we also want to make sure that we're able to neutralize the acids that are left behind from the pasta sauces and stuff like that, the pizza sauce, all those tomato pastes, that's all acid based. So we want to make sure that we have that titrated properly. So on this machine, this is just a legacy model A4, the A5, D2, chemical injects right here into the sump. Some of them have it located here at the top where you can unclip the snazzy new uh, hub up there that the chemicals pump through. That's genius, by the way. We're gonna use our graduated cylinder and we're gonna see, we're gonna catch, we call it catching the detergent. In this case, we're using turbo. So we're looking for around two to three at most cc's of detergent going into this machine every cycle. So I put my graduated cylinder underneath the detergent line and I start the machine. So 
I start the machine. And basically whenever the detergent would go into the sump, we're catching it in this, this vial. It has pumped. So now what I'm looking for is around two or three cc's. And we're at two. So now what I want to do with this two cc's is rinse it out. I'm going to run it and test the titration with some of these pH strips. Uh, these strips actually have indicators from acids through neutral pH and then alkalinity up through 14. So what we're looking for is a level in the 10 range, a dark green strip. So we're gonna use this strip. Now this tells me the alkalinity of the water. Typically looking for a 10. A 10 is a nice titration for an average restaurant. When you get into something that's more acidic, like an Italian restaurant or a pizza place with lots of oils, you want your pH level to be a little higher up the scale. And we have to make sure that the sanitizer setting is a minimum of 50 parts per million. What that's going to ensure is if something flips over inside the machine in the washer rinse cycle and they dump that back in, it's just going to dilute that ratio. Or if they're spraying dishes off and water is running down into the machine, we're going to lose if we're right at 50. That's like driving around with your gas light on in your car. So I want to make sure that this machine's putting out a little over 50, maybe towards the 75 parts per million range. So you can see here, our strip is definitely darker than 50 and not quite as dark as 100, which for autochlor standards is right where we want that to be. Better than not enough. Now we're gonna catch the sanitizer and rinse additive in our vial here. I shut the machine off so I can get into place here. I want, my, I want to catch my sanitizer and I want to catch my rinse additive. Make sure that the discharge tubes are in my vial and let them run. What this is going to tell us is how much of each of these products are being pumped into the machine each cycle. This machine is using one cc of rinse additive and three and a half cc's of sanitizer. So the sanitizer level was right where it needed to be for us to get the reading we need. The customer's getting great results, they're drying quickly, and one cc is within what we need it to be. I mean, it'd be great if it could be set up a little bit tighter, but you can only close the cam so much before the pump won't activate, and we're right at that point right now where it's spinning just one turn. All right, so as I was growing up, I was taught the method for cleaning things was called the watch method water, action, time, chemical, and heat. Water is the amount of water that can be soluble for chemicals to be introduced to. So if you have a gallon of, let's say you have a cup of hot tea, you can only stir so much sugar in it before you have sugar left at the bottom. So you wanna make sure that you have enough water to be able to handle the soils introduced. Action is the 22 PSI we talked about where we're actually spraying and stripping the soils off of the dishes. T is the amount of time that is in the wash cycle. By keeping an ear open for the drain open and close, how long it's filling for with the drain open, we're able to really make sure that this machine is running as long as possible to get the dishes clean. The longer the drain's open, it's not doing anything. So we only have 90 seconds to do our job. Let's make sure that we're maximizing the amount of time that we're actually doing the dishes. C is chemical. We know that we're introducing the right amount of chemical when we have the pH level set at a nice titration for the alkalinity, the sanitizer set, and it makes the health department happy, and the rinse additive is right around where we like to keep it to make sure that the dishes are drying off spot free and quickly. So hot water is something that dr plays drastically into our favor. When we're assessing an account, we have to make sure that we know where the hot water tank is. We want to know if the pipes are insulated, how large they are, what the capacity of the machine is, uh, how frequently they're using it to fill the three bowl sinks, hand sinks, bathrooms. Uh, when the water molecules 
in our machine are not hot. They are not open and receptible to taking soils away. When the water molecule gets hot, it opens up. The chemical mastermind behind the detergent is to capture the soils in this open molecule and strip them down the drain. When that molecule is not open, we're just bouncing soils around. And that's when you see machines that have the white buildup on the inside. We always want to make sure that we have the hottest water possible that we can get to our machine getting there. Uh, pre pretty much a range in that green spot on our thermometer. Sometimes those are some things we might have to have a conversation about with our prospects is that we want to make sure that they have the hot water that's necessary to give them the clean results and the drying time that they're looking for. So insulating pipes, upgrading hot water tank, going with one of our sustainer heaters or booster heaters. It's a simple conversation to have and it could be a big difference in their results. just went over are things that nobody really even pays attention to. You take the machine out of the wrapper, you set it in, a, in an account, you hook the chemicals up, you set them high, you roll on. That's the way it is until we come in and save the day. But having that understanding of where our business model lies and being addicted to the details that actually make that big of a difference for our customers uh, with the packaging being recyclable, with the uh, you know, the volume of water we use, actually being, being able to get one pass results on the first try uh, with reduced pre-wash and pre-scrapping procedures needing to be in play, that reduces labor cost in addition to everything else. So us being able to look at that under a microscope for our prospects is what separates us from the other guys. Um, I think that about wraps up what level of awesome is coming out of these machines that Autochlor has been producing for what, 70 years now, since the 50s. Um, let me think about what we wanna do for our clients, for our prospects, is be the best we can be all in for them. Uh, you know, when I came and met these folks, uh, they were using a different vendor. They were purchasing everything off the food truck, keeping track of all their inventory by themselves, stockpiling enough products so they didn't run out. Uh, you know our business model is to help them keep their inventory. Uh, we reduce the volume of inventory by selling quality concentrated products uh, in smaller packaging. So we went in with the conversation that we wanted to be their business partner for all of their chemicals, picking up the floor, the three comp sinks, sanitizers, disinfectants, window cleaners, um, and with a simple conversation about how we can break those costs down and show them real savings uh, and that they don't have to worry about is, is what gets accounts. Um, I let people know that they don't have to call us unless the machine's having a problem. Other than that, we're going to be there every 28 days and take care of them. Um, we provide safety data sheets for all of our products that are easily accessible in our binders. Uh, so a lot of people find that to be a huge benefit. So I guess the whole encompassing point of this video at the end of it is to just be a great partner for our prospects. We want to make sure that we're doing right by them. I tell my customers flat out, I'm going to spend your money like it's my own and I'm tight with it. So they always appreciate my honesty. If there's something that I think could be adjusted or modified, I always make sure I do that. It's better to sell a customer some products over 20 years than make quick dollars over a short period of time until you get caught or until something's not right or our competition comes in and sees us doing something that they can make right. Always ask your customers if there's anything we could be doing better. If there is, improve on it. Once they've said that everything's fantastic, ask them for a five-star review on Google. And other than that, we're night and day better than the competition could ever dream of being. So with all that being said, take this stuff that we learned today, put it to use in the field, be a better business partner for our clients, take good care of our customers, keep the machines and dish pits clean, and stay safe. Have a good day.